This Week in Science and Education is presented in association with the Science Coordinators and Consultants Association of Ontario. Visit their website at sccao.ca. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you in part by the University of Western Ontario, www.uwo.ca. We thank them for their support. This Week in Science and Education is also brought to you by Laurentian University. Check out Laurentian at laurentian.ca. We thank them for their support. Hey everybody, it's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is your host, Kevin Kugler. We are recording TY's episode 61 on Thursday, December 22nd, 2011. Forensic Fireside Chats. Hey everybody, thanks for taking the time to join us today on This Week in Science and Education. Forensic Fireside Chats, this sounds like an interesting show. We're going to find out what that's all about really soon, but before we do, let me welcome to the show Dr. Thomas Merritt from Laurentian University. Hey, Thomas. Hello, folks. I'll try to make sure the phone doesn't ring halfway through today's show. <laughs> yeah, try and keep the custodians out from emptying the garbage in behind you, you know, and all that stuff. I'll do my best. Speaking of ex-custodians, my good friend Colin Jago is with us. Hey, Colin. <laughs> that's, a, that's a segue and a half. <laughs> Sometimes I don't think I'm an ex. <laughs> well, you just feel like that as a teacher, man. It's all right. It's all good. You're doing well. So, guys, we've got an interesting guest today. We're going to talk about forensics. This is Dr. Scott Fairgrief. Scott, hopefully I pronounced your last name correctly, but uh, welcome yeah. to the show. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Thanks very much. No problem. So, Scott, forensic uh, fireside chats, what's that all about? What, what are we talking about today? Well, fireside chats for me tend to be where I talk about science while a fire is going on and we're doing test burns of uh, things like pigs. Um, in forensic science, I, my specialty is dealing with burned bodies. So people that have either been caught in fires in different types of contexts or somebody where they basically have been killed by somebody else and then the perpetrator is trying to get rid of the body using fire. So uh, we have to interpret those uh, for the courts and uh, give reports and even testify at trials, which I've done. So, Scott, you're up in uh, Sudbury. You're working out of Laurentian University. Yes. Um, you must do a lot of work for, uh, you know, the, the larger population areas like the GTA. I can't think that there's that many, uh, you know, fatalities within the Sudbury area to keep you busy throughout the year. Would that be right? Well, actually, uh, we, as a forensic anthropologist... Sorry? At least I hope there isn't. Well, you know, it's interesting. I do get a few cases each year. Uh, I actually deal with all of Northern Ontario. And I, I do that work for the Office of the Chief Coroner, as well as the, uh, the newly formed Ontario Forensic Pathology Service. So I actually do that for them. But we have different forensic anthropologists in different regions of the province. So I basically handle... Northern Ontario, which if you think about it, has a land area of approximately that of Western Europe. So, but fortunately not with the uh, population density. But I'll, I'll get a few cases each year that are legitimate, uh, you know, cases. And the types of cases I tend to deal with are homicides. But a lot of what you do with, with your time I mean, it is basically search as well. Yeah, I mean, I am a faculty member and uh, the bulk of my time is doing uh, teaching in the forensic science program here, as well as doing research, and but my research goes back to the type of cases I do. So, mm -hmm. if I can, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted you to come on and talk to us is, is you know, everybody's seen the, the, the crime shows, but sure. what can you actually tell from a crime scene with, with evidence? And then how does your research allow you to do that better? Well, dealing with evidence is, is a very specialized type of approach. Uh, when we go to a crime scene, and that's generally, I will be one of the people that does go to the scene, especially if we're dealing with human uh, remains, there is a way of collecting that evidence so we can maximize the type of, shall we say, interpretation we can get out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you process a crime scene, you're actually destroying it. So you yeah. get one chance to do right. it, right. and then you have to uh, essentially record everything, get that evidence properly seized, properly packaged, and brought back to the lab yeah. in order to process it. So what we can get is, we're different from a lot of sciences. We don't get to choose, at least at crime scenes, what our samples are. We don't have to say, well, I need this sample size, or I need yeah. to do this analysis. 
Mm. You basically get what you get. And my job as a researcher is to come up with scenarios that I've in, or ones that I've encountered and say, okay, what were the problems with that? Uh, where is there a gap in our knowledge? And how do I fill that in? So for me, it's fire changing the body. And you've probably have all seen these TV shows where they are talking about an autopsy or they say, oh, we're doing the autopsy like on CSI or what have you. And that's one extent. But then if you think about it, all those things are being eliminated or altered by fire. And mm -hmm. fire is a very powerful force to do that. So I have to know when I'm looking at something, okay, is that crack on that bone due to the fact that that's from the fire? Is the crack on that bone due to the fact that this person was hit, maybe in the head? Mm -hmm. um, was uh, there, shall we say, an indentation on the bone? Is that due to an ax? Is that due to a, uh, a knife? So what is it that caused it? And how can I tell these things from the burned bones? So that's the real challenge of it. So do you actually get to go out to big carcasses and hit them with hatchets and then burn them? <laughs> yeah, actually, but it's part, of the, part of the research is we have to use a model. And our analog or model for that is, of course, uh, going to be something as close to human without it being human. And the general research model that we all use are going to be domestic pigs. Uh, they're readily available. Uh, we can uh, get a hold of them uh, fairly easily. We can, Unless we, they're greased, right? And they're harder to get a hold of. Greased, uh, greased pigs are very hard to hold, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I usually don't run after them, fortunately. But we can even go to a butcher shop yeah. and get the fragments we need, right. even with flesh on them. Uh, so if I need a hind limb, I can get it. Uh, if I need ribs, I can get it. And so, for instance, I just finished a study on cup marks in ribs because the chest area of a person is the most common place to yeah. receive knife wounds. So mm. we didn't have anything to say, boy, if somebody burns a body and we've got ribs, yeah. uh, how can I be sure that what I'm looking at is a cut mark from a knife rather than some other artifact from the fire? Yeah. Right. Scott, that if I'm not mistaken, uh, Colin wanted to jump in there. Go ahead, Colin. Well, yeah. and you're, sort of, you're sort of talking about it. it like, as a science teacher and science enthusiast, I guess, the most fascinating part about some of the shows like CSI is when they do experiments. Like I was watching a, a taped episode last night where they had a whole bunch of different, um, I think it was canes, that they were trying to see matched a mark. And they're whacking these, these models to see which mark matches the cane to try and, try and draw this conclusion. So yeah. if I'm understanding it, these are exactly the kind of experiments that sort of drive your research, where you've got a problem, and it, it may be well after the, the actual case or something, but you realize there's a gap in our understanding of a particular thing, and so you're yes. doing some of these experiments in a very controlled, very, uh, um, well, modern scientific way, and it's not like on CSI where they do it over 20 minutes and say, okay, Eureka, it's this one, but you're doing yeah. it in a lab under con you know, very controlled conditions. So is that, is that, am I getting sort of the, the general gist of, of the focus? Yeah, you are. And in fact, uh, to use the example of the canes, for example, mm -hmm. what uh, we're limited in forensic science on the types of conclusions we can draw. For instance, one right. of the words we don't use in forensic science is match. We call it the M word. And we just, <laughs> because once you go into a courtroom, if you use the word match, it's been decided right. by the law to be prejudicial against the defendant. Sure. So what we're actually saying is that if you come out in a report or on the stand and say match, that means to the exclusion of all other possibilities, there is only mm -hmm. one and that's it. Scientifically, right. we have to recognize a range of possibilities. So if we're looking at different types of evidence, for instance, the cut mark, I will list all the different features that I see and say this is a cut mark based on this, this, and this. However, in your example of a cane to see a mark on it, they would have to essentially say something like, okay, uh, this looks like that, the characteristics are similar, and instead of saying match, we would fail to exclude mm -hmm. this. Okay, and that's a big phrase in forensic science, this whole idea sure. of fail to exclude. Uh, mm -hmm. Even with DNA analysis, if you look at all of the, um, the data they have in the DNA data bank, when mm -hmm. a probability is generated based on DNA as to identity of who it is, 
that probability is always given the most favorable. In other words, right. what's most in favor of the defendant? Okay, right. uh, so you may have a white female and you're trying to see if the DNA match, say that, or let's say a suspect, even better. <laughs> let's say you've got a white male suspect. Well, it turns out that if you do the DNA and they compare it to that DNA, what they'll do is they'll look at the different loci or locations and they'll basically generate probabilities and they might use frequencies for those that have nothing to do with white males. The highest right. frequencies are always going to be the ones they use. So we're, we're trying to do, rather than nail somebody for something, uh, you know, we've got to find this guy's guilty, we've got to put this guy at the scene, we will actually go to the point where we are saying, okay, let's take the approach that we're trying to exclude this suspect. Hmm. We're going to bend over backwards, we're going to check everything we can, and if we can find a way to exclude them, great, then they're no longer in the picture. Hmm. But then there's the other way that we, when we come out at the end and we can say, listen, we did the following tests, we did the following things, here's our list, here's our practices for saying why we do these things. We hmm. match the standards, of course, and then we can say we failed to exclude. So it's ultimately the courtroom is where our science is judged. So I can't say I can't say I think it's this guy, and you know we got some really interesting DNA here, or you know right. I've got some cut marks here, and you know and I've got some DNA and everything else, and you know if I were you on the jury, yeah I would vote this guy guilty, uh, but you know you got to keep in mind you can't do that. <laughs> Scott, I've got a lot of questions for you. I'm sure the other guys do as well. We've got to take a quick break, though, and uh, we'll come back and ask those questions in a second. We're talking with Dr. Scott Fairgree from Laurentian University about forensics. Uh, we'll be right back in this uh, two-minute break. Thanks, everybody, for staying with us. Okay. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning at Sheridan Students Shine Brighter. Check out sheridanc.on.ca. And we're back. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with this week in science and education. We're talking with Dr. Scott Fairgrieve, who is a forensic scientist from Laurentian University. And, uh, Scott, I guess the, the first question that I had, and this is fascinating, you know, from a legal perspective, because um, I think maybe a lot of people don't understand that when you get into the type of job that you're in, and certainly as young students, we tend to forget that we will be called upon as experts in cases as our career evolves. And, Perhaps there's a certain element of training that we have to undergo to prepare us for presenting these arguments or presenting the science in a courtroom. Sure. What kind of training did you have to go through in order to, uh, you know, to be able to give testimony appropriately and scientifically, if you will? Well, I think first and foremost what people have to realize is you're becoming a scientist first. Okay, so you have to have your basic science skills and math skills, etc., under your belt. So this means the biologies, the chemistries, the maths, uh, those sorts of things you actually have to have. The other thing are good communication skills. You have to be able to write because you're going to be doing reports. And then you have to be able to get up into a courtroom or get up in front of a group and explain your report under questioning, but not do it as, shall we say, a scientist talking to other scientists. If you actually look at the people on a jury, we've been told to gear things to about a grade 8 to grade 9 education level. Yeah. Okay? Which surprises some people, but there's quite a diversity of people out there with all sorts of different levels of education that end up on juries. So you basically have to not get up there and try to confuse people. So the background that you have to have is become very conversant in your science area of interest and then uh, learn through various professional organizations um, how to give evidence. Now, when I was going through, there was no such thing as a forensic science program in Canada at all. Okay? The scientists that we had doing forensic science were coming out of, let's say, biology programs, chemistry programs, and the like. But now we actually have here at Laurentian, for example, and at other places, an actual forensic science degree program that emphasizes all of the areas of science I just mentioned to get that training. But we're doing it in a forensic context, and we're teaching people the language of how to talk about their evidence, 
how to present it in a clear manner, but also how to draw unbiased conclusions. And that's mm. a huge, yeah. huge area, yeah. is the unbiased right. report. Sure. So when you actually get to that point, uh, what I would say to high school students is, you know, definitely you've got to be conversant within your various different core sciences and maths, as well as the language of your tourists. If you're in an English school, then English is going to be very key. In fact, we require people to have their uh, grade 12 English uh, before they come into our program. So we want them to be able to communicate. Sorry, we're yeah. you know going back, guys, um, quite a few hmm. shows now. We were talking to Mike Noonan about um, science education and, and the approach that, that his group has been taking to educating scientists. Yeah. One of the, the, the points that we spent a lot of time talking about is, is the focus now on teaching high school kids um, to draw conclusions and then to defend their position. And you know, it, not yeah. from not from an aggressive point of view or a defensive point of view, but these are the things that we know. Yes. And you know, the, one of the things that stuck in my head when I was a PhD student that my my advisor was really good at saying was, I, I don't know that. And you know, what are the things that we don't know? Yes. And and not overstating because you want to make a point. Yeah. You know, how do you you teach? budding scientists or high school kids or whoever yeah. it is, yeah. to, to, to get their point across with what they actually do know mm -hmm. and be very upfront about what they don't know. Um, one of the things that I've worked with all of my graduate students over and over again is the idea of assumptions. So what are the assumptions that we've made yeah. um, in, in the material that we're, that we're presenting? Um, but listening to you, you know, in your particular field, like you say, it's absolutely vital to be a good scientist. Yeah. Um, but those communication skills are something we've talked about quite a bit on the podcast. How do we teach students to be really good, self-confident, yeah. but not arrogant, not overstepping bounds, communicate? Yeah. So that's a really good point. Well, the, I'll give you an example of how I've done it because I have gone into high schools and we actually have high schools come here to our labs and I actually do a day-long workshop with them. And one of the things I do with them is blood stain pattern analysis. And the reason I do that is because it brings in physics. Physics teachers are asking me all the time, how can I bring physics into the, like the forensic sphere of physics and make physics more exciting? Because they said, you know, to drawing, drawing cannonballs going across the sky, you know, just isn't doing it for them. <laughs> and, uh, I said, and I usually say a really great way to show how trig is important, integrated with the movement of objects, is how blood is deposited at a scene. And it can be simply something as simple as having a dropper with a colored liquid going onto a piece of paper and then having it at different angles. Mm -hmm. And they very quickly learn, okay, well, why is trig useful in that? And then the students have to figure out, okay, well, I've got a blood stain that has an ellipse. And if I measure the width of that ellipse by the length of that and divide by the length of that ellipse, and I take the inverse sign, I get the angle of impact. And mm -hmm. if I do that with a bunch of them, I can take strings and come back out to a point of convergence, and that tells me where that blood came from. Yeah. So you can come well, up with CSI scenarios. CSI did get it right for the string thing. Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, most people still use strings, um, yeah. in spite of the fact that people are out there trying to sell lasers, but uh, strings are cheap. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the stuff we get in order to do forensic science, we can go to Canadian Tire and get. It awesome. surprises people that, you know, I almost like to say this is sponsored by Canadian Tire because we get so many <laughs> things we need. Uh, but the, the idea is we come up with a scenario and uh, we give them an actual problem to solve and we do say, what do you know? For instance, I'll say you've just entered a room and you have red splotches of material on the floor. And immediately, many people will say, blood. And then I go, how do you know? Well, it's a crime scene. I said, but there's no body. How do you know a crime took place here? How do you know that's not chicken blood? How do you know that that's uh, any sort of blood at all? And then they go, oh, yeah, you're kind of right. We've got to think back. So just identifying what's there is a basic step. And then going from there, okay, we'll, we teach them, for instance, what are presumptive tests? Tests that will actually help you to say, okay, I can't rule blood out, 
until so I'm going to proceed as if this is blood. Hmm. And we collect that evidence, and then we go from the crime scene, and then we get it into the lab where we confirm it. So for high school students, and the teachers specifically, I would say there's actually quite a few things out there on the Internet that give various different uh, scenarios and how you can use common items. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, having white powder in little bags. You know, I've been in different labs around here, and I see white in bags all the time. Now, you know, as a forensic scientist, my question is, oh, is that cocaine? Is it something else? And But then I see the coffee machine next to it. You know, <laughs> it's sugar. Okay, well, how do I know? It's not a cover for sugar, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but there's ways to test. And you kind of have to teach students not to make an assumption that isn't – that isn't founded, yeah. okay? So you've got to actually get a fact. Yeah. And the flights of fancy people go on. I have students <laughs> say to me, well, okay, I've, we've got a hole in the skull, okay? And I'll say, well, then there's a hole right here on the skull. What do you think? Oh, I've had all people, sorts of people give me, you know, that don't know the anatomy, all sorts of wonderful ideas and questions, but I'll say, but that hole occurs naturally. And they go, mm. oh, okay, so... Now you're telling me I've got to know the human skeleton before I can actually start talking about what differences on the skeleton are. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, no. we've, we've got to, we're always comparing. Uh, one of the nicest things I like to say to students to kind of bring them to ease with forensic science is most of what you need to know in order to be a good forensic scientist, it's no joke you learned in kindergarten. <laughs> and what you learned was that game, which of these does not belong? <laughs> You're doing comparisons. Hey, great at that game. Test me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's all about comparison. So how are things different? Why are things different? And how significant is that difference? Scott, so, you're one of those uh, guests. I'm sorry to cut you off, but we're about five minutes over time. I do want to get one more question in from Colin. And um, because... because it, it's very often when I was, and I was the reason I'm going to say it. I was reading some of the research that was published on your your lab's website. Uh, some of the stuff that was published by students, which really got me intrigued, because they're talking about axe and hatchet trauma in long bones and things like that. Just really fun yeah. stuff to read, you know, with yeah. two days before Christmas. Really good stuff. But it occurred to me that some of these things, from a student point of view, a are engaging as all get out, but b are totally doable. I'm thinking about science yeah. fairs and things like that. Because yeah. you mentioned Canadian Tire and you mentioned pigs. It's not that big a stretch to think that, that a high school student can take axes and saws and start hacking away at things and doing some of their own analysis. So, yeah. you know, what kind of things, if you want to get a, a teacher or a student in high school to think about doing projects, open-ended projects around forensics, what kind of things could they do in high schools that, that might be uh, of interest or long-term of some use? Like, what are some gaps that high school students can approach uh, to study? Yeah, well, the thing is, uh, for instance, uh, high schools being located all over the place, we do not have a good database in the province of insect succession on remains. Okay, hmm. forensic entomology, forensic bugs. Uh, all you have to do is get some, uh, get some meat from a butcher shop, put it out there, and then have uh, students start to watch what flies come on there, how quickly they come on, what are the different types? They can capture the flies. The flies lay maggots onto the meat. Uh, they can there's ways of collecting the maggots. Um, they can actually rear the maggots so they can identify them later so that they can, there's actually a way of capturing them and then you keep them in a container and the right. maggot just keeps feeding off of some liver for a while and then becomes a fly ultimately. Uh, there's all sorts of things like that that can be done all over the place. It will be a really interesting project. But you've what? also mentioned uh, saws, for instance, and axes and that. I think one of the things uh, you know Where they could do is, is get, get, a, get, a, yeah, get a long bone or something from the butcher shop. Get the bones Go they don't need. Hey, bones. bring that in your living room. Cut it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and say, uh, have people bring in different saws from home. Can they make a cut on that? and tell the difference was that that mark made by that saw or by that saw. Right. right. You know, and then they can That's find right. out, oh, it's not that easy. Yeah. Uh, you've really got to think about, okay, well, I brought in a jigsaw or a coping saw, 
This one brought in a cross-cut saw. This one brought in a regular wood saw. Right. You know, all sorts of different types. And wow, can I actually tell the difference? And that's a big issue. We've got cases where, you know, we have to be able to say something about, you know, something's been done to the body. Right. We've got the bones. And the police say, well, here's all the stuff that possibly made those marks that we found. Can you tell us something about it? And that's a real question in forensic science. Because we're trying to see, can we exclude a whole bunch of these other saws and right. get down to this one, this yeah. hatchet, and this sort of thing? But yeah. again, all of that can even be uh, based on position. How are they doing the cut? Oh, so, man. This has yeah. been so much fun today, Scott. I'm sorry to cut it off, but I, I simply must. You're, you're one of those engaging guides. I know we could sit and chat for two hours with you, and I, I'm sorry that we don't have an hour-long podcast that we used to because we would definitely be doing that right now. But uh, for now, I'll just say thank you very much, and maybe you'll come back again and we can pick up where we left off. Would you do that? Mm. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks very much for having me. Today. It's our pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. It's been Dr. Scott Fairgrieve has been our special guest today, forensic scientist from Laurentian University. Hope you learned a lot. Uh, great show, and uh, thanks for uh, Thomas to uh, to bring him along on the show today. Appreciate that connection. For Thomas Merritt and Colin Jago, this is Kevin Kugler, virtual researcher on call, saying thanks everybody for tuning into this week in science and education. Have a safe and happy holiday, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. Thanks everybody. Bye bye.